Um, I'm going to get started with my key points in case I run out of time to play, which we do, and then I'll go back and screw them. Um, so we teach our students points first right now, too, so I guess we can do what I, what I say I'm going to do. Um, so but the key points are this. So I want to talk a little bit about the idea of interspecies justice as an element of the law. The law comes starting from Dr. Klaus Bosselman's idea of ecological justice as a key pillar of nature. In trust, which is just as well as the one that's much more popular, which is usually accepted by natural law, which is interspecies justice. And as a thought experiment or a case study of that, I want to talk about uh, uh, animal based food. And so, what I want to suggest is that if we take ecological law seriously, here's one concrete case study that we can look at, which is uh, animal based food. And the argument uh, mirrors what Michael and others have been saying in uh, the, the last presentation, which is that we need to reconstruct the, the, the food system. And I'm, what I'm talking about is the industrial food system, not very local or individual you know, self-sustaining food systems, but in, in industrial, um, largely international food systems. So achieve, to do achieve interspecies justice, we need to reconstruct this food system and its laws. Part of the argument there is the idea, this perception that meat eating is a personal choice. Um, but in fact, I think that in addition to that, it's very, very highly structured by the industrial food system that we have. The industrial food system greatly shapes and limits the food choices that we have. Um, as well, the ecological law lens would suggest to us after not very much thinking and research that the industrial, the international industrial food system is colonial, exploitative, and creates injustices not only to other species, but to the current and future generations of humans. Um, for example, a lot of the things that Jeff was talking about this morning, land grabbing, why are people land grabbing? A huge driver behind that is fear of in, in, uh, insufficient food in the future. Um, we're talking about systems thinking. The whole method of producing food now is a global industrial system rather than this sort of local, even personal husbandry that it was for, for millennia. Um, and the whole idea of the path dependence of the industrial food system that Michael was talking about, we invented the car, we figured out uh, how to do industrial farming, and so now it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary and we can't possibly get around it and everyone will starve to death if we don't continue to torture chickens in tiny cages. So, so I think this whole idea of a systems thinking is very, very um, applicable to this particular case study. That this whole idea also of the need for meat, and so I think it's very important if we talk about interspecies justice that we don't also lose sight of human animals as well and injustices in terms of the in, uh, very unjust distribution of food insecurity problems, the very real problems of malnutrition and starvation in many parts of the world. Um, and so the relationship and the, the sort of ethical idea of eating meat as a necessity uh, would be very different when we take a place-based approach. So if you live in the very far north or in very extreme conditions where you don't have the option of growing soybeans, that's a very different ethical proposition. Um, and so that, that whole idea of being uh, place-based that ecological law brings also sheds light on appropriate food systems, I think. Um, the whole idea, uh, the argument that we're on this path, the industrial food system, much of the resistance to arguments against that is that, well, obviously we need to have this industrial food system and in fact increase it and export it to starving countries because their problem is that they're not producing enough food. When it's very well known um, empirically that food waste is a massive problem that could go a long way to solving food insecurity and also that it's more of a redistribution issue than, than this constant imperative need to have more food. But this is uh, sort of the gut reaction, I think, in northern and western countries. Well, if we don't have enough food, we should produce more rather than taking a green legal theory approach and saying, well, why, don't, why do some people not have enough food? It's not because we're not producing enough. Um, the whole idea of an efficient food energy ratio too has to do with inter and intragenerational justice, which I hope I'll get the time for, and then try to propose some suggestions in terms of what ecological law might require for a better food system that respects interspecies justice. So that's it in a nutshell. So I'll try to unpack some of this. So my logical sequence was, does ecological law include and require interspecies justice? And I think if you go through much of the writing of, of, of Jeff, of Klaus, of a bunch of other people, that you'll find 
that that is an, a crucial part of this whole idea of um, an interdependent relationship among all species on Earth is a big part of what ecological law is. So if we if ecological law does require interspecies justice, does interspecies justice demand uh, veganism? Does it demand that we stop eating animals? And if so, why or why not? Uh, and would veganism then enhance or challenge inter and intergenerational human justice is the question I was asking. So, you know, this whole idea of eating animals is one of the ways that we, we, we come to face interspecies justice sort of three times a day. So I think it's kind of a good uh, example, a case study of, of, of seeing where ecological law taken seriously might push us. So I think we can skip some of these slides because of, of time, there's a lots of examples of how much of the writing, uh, but I'll stop here if I, if I can, because some of these comments of, of Jeff's, I think I just have a few examples of how they are um, illustrated with the food law system. So the whole idea that human systems um, come from growth driven economic globalization. That's what Jeff has written. That's exactly what Michael was talking about and many others. And I think that um, this is exactly what happened in the food system. So a big part, for example, of why we move to industrialize animal farming and put uh, cows, pickings, chickens and, and pigs in, in factories wasn't because it sounded like a good idea or because it might be cheaper. From a lot of the literature that I've read, it's because we had, especially in, in the U.S. and other places, a huge surplus of corn. So the government system was to subsidize farmers, partly in the post-war era, etc., from employment and other drivers. And so we have this huge, vast surplus of corn. What should we do with it? Hey, if we feed it to cows, then we can stick them all in big, in, in big uh, in, in factories and get them off, off the ground. And, and, and this has had significant impacts on emissions, on waste, on methane, and a whole bunch of other types of things, as well as human health. Uh, and so the driver was not a logic even of how do we produce more food, it was how do we get rid of corn was a, one of the big drivers of this system. So even just taking that step back seems to very clearly make no sense. And so trying to fix this might not be producing more food or convincing developing countries to have taken industrial agriculture approach, but to try to figure out how we got into this situation in the first place. Um, so Jeff also talks about how ecological law should permeate all legal systems. I think food law is just a good example um, because it seems to integrate so many areas of law. So to fix the food system, you need to fix trade law. You need to fix uh, animal rights law. You need to fix property law and animals as property, pollution regulations and uh, um, protection of, of the earth and water, etc. So there's many, many areas of law that are integrated in order to solve the food problem. It's a good on the ground example of how you can't do this through just ag law or through just environmental law. It has to integrate a whole bunch of these areas, including ec the economy and things of that nature. The other example I would give is that this emphasizes a broad cultural value shift. And so this idea of meat eating is very culturally based. And so can ecology, ecological law help us to change that culture? Or indeed, has traditional law produced a culture where we perceive that eating meat is necessary for our health? It's, it's, it's sort of very vigorous and masculine, so there's a strong feminist critique of this approach. It's also a very sort of class status based thing. So there's been lots of evidence that there's been an increasing growth in meat consumption in other countries to model the Western diet. Uh, and so this is part of an export of a culture through trade laws, through lots of other laws that have created and enhanced the value that it's important and it's good to eat uh, animal-based products rather than in many countries where traditionally the uh, culture had been more of a plant-based diet uh, regime. So that has been changed by a legal export of culture. Could ecological law help us to change that value system? Um, and the, this other idea from, from Jeff's paper, we need that ecological law requires systems that improve resource productivity. So that brings me to just one sort of concrete example, if I can go forward to um, whoops, the slide <laughs> on the food conversion ratio. <laughs> Thanks. Just one more. Please. Yeah, there. So this is this idea of, of obviously, I think, if we look at it on its face, do we believe in interspecies justice that all species are of equal value? Just from a philosophical point of view, it would seem that that would suggest that it's not just to other species that we eat them. 
So killing other animals just because they taste good rather than eating things perhaps that we find less tasty doesn't seem like a good reason to do this. If you live in a certain location where you don't have that option and the only option you have is meat, then maybe you do have a different equation based on ecology because non-human animals eat each other and survive in that way because that's part of a biological imperative perhaps that might create more logic. No other animals that I'm aware of, you know, um, imprison and torture each other before eating each other. So that seems less normal. The industrial factory farming model seems different. But even if you disregard interspecies justice, as between within the current generation and future generations, this idea of meat eating also is this sort of exploitative um, approach to eating in the sense that the energy and resources required to produce meat for human consumption mean that other humans have less resources to eat as well. So this idea of the food conversion ratio that's been, uh, that's been created by several different organizations, how much energy, water, air, uh, emissions are required to produce a, a certain quantity of beef is far in excess of what it would require to feed populations with plant-based foods. And so this is a, a question of, in, of intra-generational justice as well. So the, the, there's, ecological law would seem to call for a significant change in our food system based not only on interspecies justice, which was my starting point, but also on concerns for intragenerational justice. And then of course, intergenerational justice, if I could just go to the next slide, which I don't need to go through them are very well known that the impacts of uh, animal food systems have significant impacts on the environment and on the economy. And, some, and so some of the solutions to this that we're running out of food, well, maybe we should have genetically modified salmon. Maybe we should genetically modify the cows so that they produce less methane when they eat corn. So again, it's always not questioning the, the original source of the problem and fixing things with technology. And the continued production of meat and animal-based products having these significant impacts on the environment and on the climate is an issue of intra-generational justice because it is reducing um, the resources that we have for future generations to satisfy their own nutritional needs. So those, that just seems to be some of the directions that ecological law may be pointing us in. So then I'll just flip to the second to last slide, please, to make sure that I respect time. Just one before that. Oops, no, thank you for um, not being very linear here. So to, to be um, practical in terms of uh, proposed suggestions, um, the ideal that ecological law would seem to point us in the direction of is perhaps to expand substantive animal rights. So if animals had rights, it might then be illegal to, to have battery cages, to have uh, various you know, industrial factory farming. And so recent examples of substantive animal rights that do seem to be moving forward, I know many people mentioned these as parts of, as ideas uh, or examples of successful ecological law ideas like ha the habeas corpus cases, trying to uh, get apes out of zoos by claiming habeas corpus, do you have any reason to imprison them? And which has met with some success recently in Argentina and giving rights to things like rivers. So if we can give it to rivers, why can we not give it to, to animals? Um, a ban on industrialized factory farming. So that doesn't mean all meat eating. That just means industrial factory farming with practices of animal cruelty. And so we have examples of this in the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Sweden. They have banned battery cages, for example. The Canadian Federation of, the Human, of Humane Societies is working on bringing that forward in Canada. Uh, and then from short term, perhaps easier to accomplish um, approaches are like procedural rights for animals. We've already talked about standing to sue. Uh, that seems like something that should be doable. Another practical tool uh, is this idea of agency, again, that Michael and, and uh, the previous uh, presentation was talking about. The EU is trying to put in place um, labels on animal food products that state what the treatment of the animals was so that the consumer has the agency then to decide. So the, increasing the amount of consumer information would seem to give a little bit more agency back and slightly re-democratize the food system. Of course, this is with the huge um, assuming that people have the wherewithal to choose in the market, which is a vast assumption, obviously, and very a northern and privileged viewpoint. But it's one step toward raising awareness and increasing choice. 
Um, you could go further then with labels and talk if every food product indicated the amount of water, soil, antibiotic inputs, emissions, et cetera, on its ingredients label. That could be another thing that could increase true uh, food choice for people aware of, of the various options and the consequences of those decisions. And then uh, other types of, you know, run of the mill regulatory product, uh, uh, regulatory tools, carbon taxes, taxes on industrially produced animal products, etc. Um, so this idea that we're all driven by the free market and the reason we eat meat, the reason we smoke, the reason we do other things is because we have freedom of choice and we shouldn't interfere with that. The market is not free without freedom of information about the food we eat. The degree of resistance to this kind of ecological law change that it seems to be suggesting to our industrial food system are things like the um, ag-gag laws that you find in certain jurisdictions where you can literally be put in jail for exposing the realities of industrial factory farm. I think all of this is important too in terms of uh, activism because right now in Canada, the government is developing a, a, a food policy for Canada. It's revising our Canada Food Guide. And they want to know, they're asking people and they're consulting people what should be the foundational principles of the Canada Food Guide, the, the National Food Policy for Canada. If we said ecological law, including interspecies, inter and intra-generational human justice, I think that would have a very significant impact on the shape of the Canada Food Guide, which would then make changes to trade, to agriculture policy, to environmental protection and all the rest of it. So it would have quite a sweeping effect a big change to international industrialized food systems would have quite a sweeping effect on laws across a number of boards. So I just thought that the food system was a good thought experiment to see what, where ecological law might take us. And so those are just some thoughts. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and now we have uh, the five minutes of questions or comments allowed. Um, <laughs> you have to be nice to me. Yes. Well, I, I, <laughs> no, no, I don't have to. I'm kidding. You. There's I'm kidding. academic <laughs> freedom. That's right. That's right. Okay. So my, I have two uh, thoughts more than to, to throw at you. So I'm not going to be uh, one coming from uh, Jeremy's presentation and one from Michael's. What's the um, sort of stake of the state uh, in the food system? You know, is this like the fact that it's a food system is already problematic, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And and your last uh, comment uh, where you had these suggestions that perhaps, you know, if the state were to, like if our government now were to decide to adopt ecological law, it will then go and, and change everything. It's mm -hmm. like, so it's a very benign, I'm always that's a true. pessimist in the <laughs> crowd. That's so true. Just your thoughts. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting thing. When did when did the a food system start to exist and when did the state become in charge of it? And the conflict of interest that's within the, the, the government in relation to food systems, because it is concerned with, with the, the, we have all these different siloed departments. The Department of Health is concerned with human health. And so they're talking about obesity and healthy and safe food. Then the Department of uh, the Environment is talking about uh, sustainability and emissions. And then the Agricultural Department and the Trade Department are talking about increasing Canadian exports. So the government itself has these four pillars that are all well identified. I would say uh, kudos to the current federal government that it has been consulting so widely with civil society movements and hearing so much from food security and food sovereignty activists. But these four pillars are already sort of in contradiction and they have departments literally pointing, you know, guns at each other in, in a way, although they're trying to collaborate. So yes, you're right. Asking the government to adopt an ecological law perspective to solve everything is probably not an idea, but, but I just, I was just thinking as an example, this is a moment perhaps of some, right. um, uh, some, this significance to the, with the, where the doors are open a little bit to public uh, input on changing systems. Other comments or questions? Yes, <clears throat> advertisement for my son's company. Oh, uh, there you called go. called Beyond Meat. Yeah. And which his goal is to basically drive industrial agriculture out, out of the market mm -hmm. by making stuff that tastes like yeah. real so called hamburgers and stuff. There are, actually are great. Mm -hmm. I've been on P4A students every year. <laughs> so far, so good. And then, to ba his basic idea is that you can grow uh, what's called direct protein. Absolutely, protein yeah. 
and vegetables and eat it. Mm -hmm. So that we've been doing for a long time now, already. It's not a new mm -hmm. idea. Really. Yeah, yeah, I had that one of my other wonderful doctoral students is talking about that, the technological solutions, which is interesting as well. Yeah, he yeah. just went to retail with one of his products in the UK. Interesting. Mm. The only thing I would say, which is uh, the, the irony, it's often the paradox, because what people talking about veganism used to be kind of like mentioning capitalism, that if you mention veganism, you're clearly crazy and <laughs> we'll move on to somebody else. But now you see all these posters mm. that James Cameron and the, the, the head of Virgin Airways are interested in plant-based alternatives and you can make money out of it and now it's cool. So, so you don't want that to be the driver, but if that's helping get to the, get to the results, then so you, you know, that's, that's a, a difficult paradox to be stuck in. I wonder, um, I think this is pretty much a softball. <laughs> so, so in my presentation, the, 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 the front picture there was, uh, I kind of think it's so we're some, some uh, well, in the deco community, I, I heard this thing called um, Nowtopias, like huh. little mini versions of things we might want to see. Now, so cooperatives are like a, a, a business model that maybe we're just um, still in North America, except for that, which is probably the best. Um, not really, I think But the other one is the community supported agriculture. We're talking mm -hmm. about food systems. And what I, I just wonder what, you, what your thought is about that in terms of, in terms of where we are. Whether how it would fit into ecological law. Because part of that is, you know, what I like is you, you, you buy into it, and if it's a good year, you, the, the, you share the, the, the gain, and if it's a bad year, you share the pain, and over time, um, right. it works out. And, 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 and these farmers that I work with, as far as I know, they're not trying to get rich. They have, you know, their experience in dealing with that model, they, you know, I talked to them about it, you know, this week it was that, and it's exciting, they love it. My experience riding my bike along the stream canal to pick up those veggies, and then having these beautiful vegetables for that week, is also, you know, there's there's there, there's value there that you can put a price on. So I wonder if you, what do you think about that? Well, I think that that's an excellent example of just stepping outside the system. That is a, a great method of resistance, and I think Michael was talking about the local, or the principle of subsidiarity, so that you're, you're rejecting the whole idea that food has to come from an international factory. And, and back to traditional models, and that's another thing in terms of this idea of um, the, the path. Once you, you've, well, somebody figured out that you can grow cows in, 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 um, in factories, well, that, and, and now the meat's cheaper, so that's the way to go. It's so recent. You know, mm. when, when I actually started to look into this, it's, you know, even when my parents, uh, you know, in the, the 50s or the 40s, this wasn't a thing. Or where it, very, it was very rare, a very small number. So the growth of this system has been extremely recent. So the idea that it's totally irreversible seems ridiculous to me. That it's, it's not like we, have, we can't think of any better way. We did it a different way for many, many millions of years. And the, and the constant argument that well, it's because we have a larger population. So we have to produce more food very, very quickly without stopping to think, could we solve this through food waste reduction? Could we solve this through redistribution that people seem to be greatly aware of? And the increasing research about, there, there was so much documentation on the benefits of the Green Revolution, and I'm sure there were some, and if my child was starving right now, I would probably prefer GM food than, than the long-term view. But the, the literature seems to suggest that the Green Revolution has had significantly negative impacts over the long term too. So that example, should be leading us to think about these alternative systems. So yeah. Thank you again, Heather and commenters.